This economy is not even landing at all, some of the strategists on Wall Street are saying. And they're not talking about any sort of recession fears. And they're pretending like only a couple months ago, they were talking about hard landing, recession. And it's like, you know, I remember what you said before. <laughs> so kind of frustrating. And for the record, you know, we've been relatively on the same track the whole time talking about softer landing or no landing at all. I think we were one of the first people to say that. Hey, Chris, you know, it's not good enough that Stuart Varney and Marie Bartiromo and all these other folks on TV told Ryan he's been right. You know, it's not enough. He has to talk about it on the <laughs> podcast too. I mean, really, come well, on. I have a very large ego, Bob, let's huh? be honest. A very large ego. Well, I think a lot of this has to do with uh, that big birthday party, Chris, that was last weekend. Bull market turned two years old. Suddenly, everybody rewrites history in terms of what they said and what they believed over those two years. Has it felt like a bull market for you for two years? For me, absolutely. For our clients and our prospective clients, I don't think so. But, you know, one thing I do want to comment on, um, you know, I do think inflation is going to go back up. And, you know, I also think Ryan's ego is going to continue to inflate. So I think <laughs> there's a correlation between Ryan's ego and inflation. But, you know, I was talking to a client of mine uh, this, this past couple of days. And one of the things she commented on was the fact that we're finally getting some positive returns after being in a downturn for the past four years. Um, I pointed out to her that her portfolio was only down for about a year and, uh, you know, we have been up for the past two years. So, it, you know, it, it seems like those bear markets uh, last a lot longer than those bull markets, at least in our own minds. Yeah, I just can't believe, Chris, you didn't sell everything, pay huge capital gains tax and then get people back in right before it, you know, so that stopped, <laughs> stopped going down. Well, you know, one thing I really hate more than anything is paying more taxes than I have to. Well, it is remarkable, right? Like, to your point, Bob, the market's up 60% over two years. It is the anniversary of this month. Amazing. But even last October, you know, markets have been sideways for a while. And we actually had to do a big conference call for all our clients to keep them invested because everyone wanted to get out of the market. Fear was so high. I mean, it was right around Halloween and it was just like apocalypse now. Now it's a year later and it's just risk on. Everyone's more bullish than ever. Hence, the market's gone up a lot. And it just seems like people's emotions when it comes in to investing, they just oscillate between fear and greed. And we're certainly getting on the more greedy side now that, that markets have gone up so much over the course of like such a short period of time. You know, right. There is some sentiment that uh, you and dad's calming voices during our fireside chats actually have some uh, market movement uh, substance to them. You know, it seems like every time we do those, the market goes up. I don't know. What are you saying, Chris? It's time to go to the videotape. <laughs> Let's go to the videotape. Let's hear what they had to say. Um, but, you know, I mean, it, it, it just goes to show you, like the bear market that ended two years ago, right? It was, it was sentiment driven, right? It's driven by the headlines. Russia just invaded Ukraine, right? Uh, Europe was going to be in a uh, financial disaster because energy costs, they wouldn't have access to energy. Cost of oil was going to go through the roof. Uh, you know, it was 100% was certainty about the, our economy failing. It wasn't about... Uh, wh whether or not we're going to go into recession was going to be how deep was that recession going to be. <laughs> so when you look for the headlines, you know, to drive your investment decision, you're going to wait a long time because waiting for, for waiting for perfection, even for good, you know, can be very, very costly. No, it really can. And I think it's also, you know, the dynamics are always changing, right? I mean, just like sentiment can change on a dime. Um, and, you know, one thing that we're seeing right now is the Federal Reserve has start cutting interest rates, which has brought short-term rates down. But ironically, maybe, we're starting to see longer term rates go up. And the whole idea of cutting interest rates, we're supposed to ease financial conditions. But with a mortgage at six and a half percent, that's not exactly easy financial condi conditions for home buyers. Well, you know, there's a, a famous term that was coined by uh, one of our favorite economists called the bond vigilantes. And, um, you know, when the Federal Reserve and Jerome Powell came out with that very dovish statement and very dovish move, cutting interest rates by 50 basis points, a gigantic move, you know, relative to what the Fed had been doing. Bond Vigilante said, whoa, buddy, we're not, uh, we're not ready for this yet. We may have some inflation being a little sticky and, you know, you got to pay attention to what the bond vigilantes are doing with longer term interest rates. Well, you know what? I feel like when the Fed changes interest rates, it's kind of the equivalent of looking down at your feet because uh, it really only has an impact on the short term rates. Um, you know, if you pick your head up and you look out to the longer term towards the horizon, you know, the 10 year rates are starting to go up. Some of the longer term rates are actually increasing. Well, it's a lot of irony there, too, because by the Fed cutting interest rates, it's lo it's loosening financial conditions, which is heating up the economy, which actually pushes longer terms, ter longer term rates up. And it's so funny because only a couple of weeks ago when we had a weak jobs number, which wasn't even that weak, 
everyone said, oh my God, the Fed, they're late to the party, the recession's coming. And of course they're proven completely wrong because then the next numbers that came out for labor were strong again. And everyone's saying, now wait, now the Fed's cutting too quickly. So it's just amazing how the mindset and the strategist changed so quickly. I think that's kind of the theme today. But now the reality of it is they could be risking overheating the economy. Well, it just goes, to, I think it's important to study history because you have to go back to two years ago uh, when the bear market ended, right? When this current bull market started, um, you have to go back in the minds of investors. I mean, we had folks that were panicking or people that were panicking out, panicking out of the market because, you know, oil was going to go through the roof. Well, you know, the market is sometimes smarter than all of us. And again, you know, there's always practical solutions, right? There, somehow Russia was able to get their tankers out and sell their oil um, as a, you know, and get around the sanctions. So, you know, we have huge geopolitical risk and we had this huge belief that inflation would do nothing but go up. And of course, you know, it turned on a dime, went the other direction. Yeah. So, you know, always think about these things, you know, yeah. when you try to make a rash decision on how you felt during different periods. Everybody yeah. forgets how they felt two years ago, guys, yeah. I guarantee it. Well, now you kind of have the opposite problem too, right? Because everyone's thinking inflation's down, but now we have the risk of inflation being reignited. <laughs> so it, it's kind of a wild thing. And I think this is also when it comes to positioning your portfolio, when we've been talking about this a lot is you really have to start thinking about inflation. And I think most of us haven't done that. And when you learned a bad, you know, a lot of us learned a, a tough lesson on that. We got a 5% interest rate on our money market fund, but we paid taxes on that. And after inflation at over 3%, we made no money. So, you know, really thinking about the cost of living moving forward and what the Fed's doing with all the government spending going on, it doesn't look like it's going to be a very disinflationary time moving forward. Well, you know, just like anything, waiting for the good news when the market's in a bear market uh, can be very costly and waiting for bad news, you know, before you, uh, you know, start to rebalance your portfolio, you know, can be very costly. And you know, I, I love to read the Wall Street Journal, read Barron's, read it all, as you guys do. But you know what I enjoy more? I enjoy the comments. And recently there was an article <laughs> about rebalancing your portfolio. Now, take a little bit of risk off the table. Every single comment was, don't listen to these guys. They're nuts. You never want to own bonds. All you have to do is be long Microsoft. I own Microsoft for 40 years and I'm up so much. You know, you never see people say I'm up Microsoft when they're down 50%, right? They only brag about it when it's hitting an all-time record high. So it's never that easy. And it's always smart, you know, to be balanced in your thinking and in your portfolio, right guys? Well, I think it goes back to the old Warren Buffett quote, right? Be fearful when others are greedy. And I think it's good to heed his advice right now because the animal spirits are out. There's a lot, maybe too much optimism in the air. It's a good time to reassess your portfolio, reassess your situation and make sure when the tide does eventually go out, you're not swimming naked. Well, you know, it's so. great. When uh, I was away last week when you did the podcast and you talked about the election and the implications of the election. And uh, I had a good client, good friend call me up and said, you know, hey, I, I listened to the podcast. It was really good. You know, kids did a great job. But Bob, don't you think this election's different this time? <laughs> <laughs> so clearly our message didn't get through. Yeah. <laughs> But I think that is a good point too, is like, you don't want to wait to invest right now, but there's so much ample opportunity out there. If you get a global recovery at some point, which it looks like we kind of are, uh, that's going to be great for so many places to allocate your capital. So I think right now more than ever, I think the, the probably the, the right strategy is max diversification. And we're really not seeing that with a lot of the portfolios that we review. You know, I, I kind of feel like uh, it, during this period of time when things are so volatile, people are so concerned, you know, they, they make those comments, okay, I'm going to get in, you know, when the market starts to go up or I'm going to get out when the market starts to go down. It, it kind of reminds me of that scene in Rocky where he was ch chasing the rooster around the yard. You know, you just <laughs> never catch up. No, you never do. And, 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 you know, how many times, Chris, have you sat down with a, a new client and, you know, they tell you how they want to be conservative and, you know, they, um, and then within a couple of months when the market gets, starts to heat up, they want to start to speculate. And then you have to remind them that when they transferred their account to us, they had a million dollar tax loss carry forward, which didn't come from being prudent and balanced. It came from their speculative ideas. Um, <laughs> so no one remembers, you know, the gambling that they did in the market that failed, right? Nobody wants to remember those. It's too painful to remember. Um, and it's, you know, it's a good thing to have us to remind them once in a while.
Hey, hope you're enjoying the most recent episode of Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you want a more hands-on approach and you saved over a million dollars, Bob, Chris, and I will put together for you our total financial master plan, and we'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. We literally look at everything. We go as far as building you, your own personalized financial portal. We'll give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, and we'll hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. Whether it's an income plan for retirement, how do you take social security? How do you draw from your portfolio? How do you factor in inflation? We'll build a dynamic income plan for you. We'll look at diversification. Has your portfolio been up and down with the markets, extremely volatile, or have you been sitting in cash? Paralysis by analysis, you can't figure out what to do. We'll put together a full investment game plan tied to your goals, show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life and we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, mutual fund, brokerage product, we'll do a deep dive of every investment you own. We'll show you how to reduce the cost, optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make, it's what you take. You'll get our full tax playbook. If you want this full holistic review and you saved over a million dollars, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan or click the link below to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E. Having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And Bob, you just sent me an article in the Wall Street Journal about Social Security. And this year, you're getting the slowest or the smallest increase in four years, only 2.5%. And I suspect that might not be really keeping up with with the real inflation that people are feeling on a day-to-day -day basis. Call me a cynic, Bob. Well, first of all, Riley, I'm not going to call you cynical, especially if you meet my request. I'm, this is actually to motivate you guys, right? Because, you know, my cost of living increase, my Social Security checks, not keeping up with the inflation of my food and energy costs, and especially my insurance costs. So I think not just you, but I think all millennials and all Gen Zers should be kicking in a little extra those poor baby boomers who didn't get a very big cost of living index, you know, in, in, increase in our social security payment next year. Well, you know what, Dad, I, I, I'll make the sacrifice. You know, Ryan and I will never probably get social security, but we'll, we'll promise to keep kicking <laughs> in those payments just for you. I guess that really endears you guys to the baby boomers, doesn't it? Well, it checks in the mail, buddy. Checks in the mail. But, you know, this, this is like insult to injury, though, guys, right? I mean, prices, everything's gone up 20% in the last couple of years. Well, it is because wages have not kept up with energy prices, and food prices, and we already know housing's become more unaffordable since the 1980s. And I think it also reminds us that the government is not going to bail us out when it comes to our cost of living. We've got to fend for ourselves. I actually think this is great for our health and our pocketbooks because, you know, if food's becoming more expensive. Now's a good time for to go on a diet. And, uh, you know, I think more people should be sailing and using less fossil fuels. Chris, I think you've been doing too many financial plans, you know, telling people to cut their spending. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I'll tell you what, this is this is really where it's sad because, you know, higher income retirees, you know, they tend to have a balanced portfolio. They have, a you know, they have equities, they have hedges for inflation in their portfolio. But, you know, middle to lower income folks you know, tend to have their money in money market funds and CDs. So, I mean, how many financial plans, Chris, have done lately where it feels, oh, here's my Social Security, Chris. Here's my cost of living. Oh, I'm, I'm covered, right? Go away and sin no more. Yeah, well, unfortunately, that's not the case. As a matter of fact, I recently did a, uh, a projection for a prospective client. He wanted to retire pretty young at 50. And uh, I showed him that at age 85, he was going to run out of money. And he said, well, that's no problem. I'll just, I'll just live on my Social Security. I'll still have that coming in. And we did some calculations, and we figured that wouldn't even cover a half of his expenses at that period in time. Yeah, and think about it now, right? I mean, with these small Social Security adjustments, it, it's just not keeping up with the fact that things cost so much more than they did before the pandemic. Um, and I think this is also a good lesson in, you know, sitting in money market funds like we've talked about for a long time. And even if you're getting that wonderful 4 or 5%, it hasn't kept up with the cost of living. Um, and I think that's really critical because inflation has come down a lot. But as we look ahead and read the tea leaves, Inflation is probably not going away. You know, it's not going to be super low like it was the last decade. No, I'm seeing that, uh, you know, with interest rates backing up here, guys, the market, the bond gods are telling us that that inflation is being a little more sticky than maybe perhaps a Federal Reserve estimated when they cut, you know, interest rates 50 basis points. But, um, you know, you really do need to have that hedge against inflation because even as this cost of living increase that's coming through some Social Security for most retirees, they're going to see their Medicare Part B increase in cost 
and pretty much wipe that out. So it's, um, you know, it puts a lot of folks between a rock and a hard place when they don't account for inflation. So dad, if I hear you, what you're saying correctly, you're not going to be living larger now because of the, your 2.5% increase. Uh, I don't know. I don't know any other way to live though, Chris, come on. You know, you're, I would never you're, discount Bob's ability to live better than he did before. Yes, you, know. <laughs> no the, you, know. you can throw the kitchen sink at Bob and he'll figure out a way to spend more. Well, it's um, always been our job, guys, to help our clients <laughs> out earn their ability to live large, you know, so everybody wants to live large. If they're going to be a client of ours, we allow it and, uh, you know, we, we make it happen. But, but I think it brings up a really good point um, that you can't just have an income plan. You have to have an income plan that's increasing cash flow over time. A good example is, well, guess what? Dividends this year are going up like 5%. Well, that's a much bigger raise than Social Security. And we know that interest rates have gone up a lot now too. So if you lock into a bond portfolio now, yields are a lot higher. So, and I think this is one of my big knocks on annuities as well. Once you get that fixed income for life or guaranteed income, it's the same amount every single year. Your cost of living is going to go up exponentially. Yeah, but amazing. It's amazing how those things are sold on fear, right? They're not sold on, you know, practicality. And that really is. I mean, when you're sitting there, if you're doing a back of the envelope assumption about what your costs are going to be in your lifetime or how much money you have, you really do need to do that compounding, not just on your portfolio, but the compounding of inflation and your expenses. You know, you really think, uh, you think about where inflation is going to average 3%. I mean, that means your expenses are going to double like every 20, 15, 20 years. Yeah. And what blows my mind is if you look at most people's portfolio today, your portfolio probably isn't addressing the elephant in the room. And that is more inflation, not less inflation, because we've already talked about it. Your money market fund, Fed's going to keep cutting interest rates. So that in return is going to get less and less. And you pay taxes on that, by the way. And furthermore, if you own a basket of growth companies or large cap stocks or the S&P 500, which is basically mainly tech stocks now, that's not historically a great inflation hedge either. I don't know, Rye. My NVIDIA stock just hit an all-time record high yesterday. Which is like winning the battle, not the war, right? Because NVIDIA was down something like 40, 50% in 2022 when inflation was at its highest. So companies like that aren't great when inflation rears its ugly head. That's probably one of the scariest issues I see with the way most portfolios are built today. Dad, why does Ryan always have to rain on my parade with this facts? <laughs> I don't know, Chris. You know, when that single stock risk is like, you know, I have the Super Bowl. My team won the Super Bowl last year, and there's an expectation that that team's going to win the Super Bowl every year for the rest of your life. Well, as a long-term, long-time Eagles fan, that breaks your heart. So you don't want to have your stock break your heart. So as Rye always says, you know, don't fall in love with your stock because your stock isn't going to love you back. Well, it's also about being proactive. It's really hard to make a move in your investment portfolio when everything's working. <laughs> but, you know, it's kind of like skiing down mogul fields. You know, I remember I used to do that when my back was a lot better <laughs> than it is today. <laughs> You're always thinking about that next mogul uh, that's down in your line of sight. And I think the same thing with investing right now. You can't think about what's working right now you have to think about what's going to come next. And everything we see is you're probably going to see more inflation than less and you're not prepared for it. Well, you know, the old expression, Chris, no, most people don't plan to fail, but they do fail to plan. All right. It's the hidden facts of finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, in 2024, Walmart store managers earned about 128,000 a year on average, up from 117,000 in 2023. Uh, however, they were only making 92,000 in 2014. So it looks like wage increases have actually been slowing versus what they were just a couple of years ago. Well, the wage increases may be slowing for Walmart employees or managers, but their stock options are going through the roof, right? It's been a great stock so far this year. And now that they're uh, delivering pharmaceuticals, uh, taking business away from CVS and Walgreens, I expect that stock option to become a little more valuable. Bob's bullish on Walmart. You heard it here first. Actually, do you have a Walmart in Florida? Uh, oh, yeah. Walmart's everywhere. Really? We don't have one here in New York. So, uh, Is that right? I don't know the joy of uh, being able to shop for everything in one place. Get that 50-gallon drum of olive oil that you always wanted. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> All right, Chris. Census data show that in 2024, 30.2% of people between ages of 25 and 34 are still living at home with their parents. Uh, the third annual, according to the third annual review of parental patronage by savings.com, 47% of parents with grown children provide them with some sort of financial support. Hint, hint, Bob. 
Well, you know, you've heard of these all-inclusive resorts. Uh, Luis and I, our lease is coming up in May. I'm thinking about maybe moving home. And, you know, Dad, I, I could use a little financial support at this point in my life. You know, Chris, uh, parental patronage is not in my vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> it's got such a nice ring to it. It makes you sound so charitable. <laughs> All right, Bob. Millennials in the middle of the wealth spectrum held average assets of 103000 in 2022, surpassing the 58000 their boomer counterparts had held in 1992 on an inflation-adjusted basis, according to a University of Bristol, England study. Well, you know, thank, uh, thank my fellow baby boomers for making everything more expensive for you guys. So it's a good thing you have a higher net worth. You're going to need it. We, we pushed up the price of housing, uh, the price of travel, um, price of everything. You know, it's like the baby boom generation has been like the pig going through the python uh, for all these years. But, hey, you know, that was one of our bullish thesis was how much, how well the, the millennials were doing. Um, and it's still amazing to this day, whenever you bring that stat up on TV, right? They always say, aren't millennials living in the basement of their parents' homes? 30% are, but I guess that counts Gen Z as well. So, well, you know, it, it, since travel is getting so expensive and, you know, the boomers are pushing those prices up, you know, a little bit of that parental patronage could be helpful at this point. <laughs> just saying. I like that. I like that. Bob, we just like a little parental patronage. That's all we ask. <laughs> all right, guys. Another great episode. 180. If you liked our podcast, you love our podcast. You know you love our podcast. Please give us that five-star rating on iTunes and Spotify. You can subscribe to our channel. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can like this episode, subscribe to our channel, and click that notification bell to be updated every week of all our new content. That's it for this week. As always, stay loose and keep an open mind. Thanks for listening to The Pain Points of Wealth. Hopefully, you found the ideas discussed in this episode valuable and useful for your own financial journey. You can find out more about Bob, Brian, and Chris's firm, Payne Capital Management, at BeBullish.com or through the contact information found in the description of this episode in your podcast player or app. Join us next week for another episode of The Pain Points of Wealth, brought to you by Payne Capital Management. Information provided on today's show is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Investment is obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed. 